Welcome back to part two of the first turn. So in the last phase, the travel phase, we saw how to get location cards out of the staging area. So in this phase, the encounter phase, it should be no surprise that this is our chance to get enemies, sometimes whether we want to or not, out of the staging area as well. Remember, every turn we are going to need to at least match our willpower strength to the threat strength of the cards in the staging area if we don't want to increase our threat level during the quest phase. And also remember, every turn we'll be adding one new encounter card to the staging area. So you might be thinking, great, this encounter phase is just what we need. A chance to get those enemies out of the staging area. But no, this is the Lord of the Rings, not Candyland. These enemies aren't leaving the staging area to go on vacation. They're coming to kill us! Okay, so basically what I'm saying is, while enemies are in the staging area, they are going to make it harder for us during the questing phase. But while they're there, they can't attack us. Once they leave the staging area, our questing phase should get easier, but then the combat phase, which by the way is right around the corner, is going to get much tougher. Sometimes we don't have a choice, and enemies will be forced to leave the staging area. You'll see why shortly. But at the beginning of every encounter phase, you get the option to voluntarily take one enemy from the staging area. And when you do that, you place it in front of you like this. Now that it has left the staging area, it is no longer contributing its threat strength to the total threat strength of the enemies in the staging area. So woohoo! <laughs> kind of. But for this turn, I'm actually choosing not to engage the enemy. So I'll put it back up here in the staging area. However, the phase is not over. We now have to do engagement checks. So to do this, I've gotten in nice and close to the enemies in our staging area, and we're going to want to look at their engagement cost. That's this number here at the top left-hand corner of their card. We have a 10 and a 25. You want to look at the highest number first, so that's our forest spider. And if its engagement cost is less than our current threat level, this enemy is automatically going to be forced to engage us. Then we move on to our next enemy, and if it also has an engagement cost that is less than our current threat level, which it does, it too is going to automatically come down and engage us. So in this case, you can see why I didn't bother to engage these enemies when I had the chance. I knew they were going to be coming for us anyway. I mean, after all, what self-respecting forest spider is going to give up the chance to have a meal of dwarf and a side helping of elf? But it's not all bad. As you've noticed, our staging area is now completely empty. So now we can move on to the combat phase. To begin, we deal one face down encounter card to each engaged enemy, starting with the enemy with the highest engagement cost. Then we have the option to declare defenders, but before we do that, let's just zoom in a little closer so we can just see our attackers and potential defenders. Alright, I've cleaned things up a little bit here, so we're looking at just our attacking enemies and our potential defending characters. The first thing I have to do is decide which enemy is going to attack first, and I'm going to have the Force Spider attack first. Now we get the option to declare defenders, and you can only declare one defender per enemy, so you can't have any team-ups. And optionally, you can declare no defenders. Once we declare a character as a defender, we have to exhaust that character. Keep in mind, attacking and defending are separate actions. So once we've exhausted a character to defend, it won't be available to us when we want to attack. For this attack, though, I'm going to exhaust the Veteran Axe Hand and declare him as the defender against the Forest Spider. Now we can resolve this attack, but first we should look at the card text on the Forest Spider. You can always ignore any text that's below this shadow icon here. We'll get to that later. So what it says here is Forced. After Forest Spider engages a player, it gets plus one attack until the end of a round. That means for this round, the attack strength of the Forest Spider is actually 3, not its original 2. Now that's bad enough, but it gets worse. We also have to flip over this encounter card, like so. If the encounter card has a shadow effect icon, like this one does, then things are going to go from bad to worse. If it hadn't had the shadow effect icon, then we would just discard this card, and it would have no effect on this attack. So let's see what we've gotten ourselves into here. The shadow effect states that the attacking enemy gets plus one attack strength, plus three instead if this attack is undefended. Okay, well, so there's some good news here. At least we defended this attack, which means it's not going to get a full plus three attack strength. However, it's now going to go from its already boosted attack strength of three to an attack strength of four. 
So to resolve this attack, we take the attack strength of our attacking enemy, which is 4, and subtract from it the defense strength of our ally, which is 1. The difference of 3 is how many damage tokens we're going to have to put on our defending character. Now usually at this point we would place 3 damage tokens on our defending character. However, you'll notice the veteran axe hand has only 2 hit points, so 3 damage is enough to kill him. Instead we just remove it from play, useless dwarf, and then we can remove the encounter card that we revealed and used during that combat. Now we just have to resolve this last attacker. And what I'm going to choose to do is leave it undefended. So to resolve this attack, we have to flip over this encounter card. Okay, this is good. There's no shadow effect icon on here, so this card is not going to have any effect on this attack and we can just discard it. Now we still have to deal with this attack. So because we declared no defenders, we take the total attack strength of this attacking enemy and we have to assign it fully to one of our heroes. We can't split it up amongst the heroes, we can't dump it all on our crappy allies, we have to give the full damage to one of our hero cards. So I'm going to give the two damage tokens to Thalen. Now I could have given them to Gimli, and because of his card text, that would have boosted his attack strength to 6. But to be honest, this early in the game, I'm not ready to put him that close to death. Okay, so now it's the good part of the combat phase, we get to fight back. We do this by exhausting a character to declare it as an attacker, and then picking one of our enemies as a target. You can even team up in this phase and have two characters exhaust together and put their combined attack strength against a single enemy. But in this case, I'm going to have Legolas attack the orcs. Now before we resolve this attack, just take your monitor and turn it up on its side so you can read this text along with me. It says, attached hero gets plus one attack strength when attacking orcs. This means Legolas is going to have an attack strength of 4. We're going to subtract from that the defense strength of our orcs, which is 0, so that means we get to put 4 damage tokens on the dull Galdor orcs. When we look at the orcs hit points, they started with 3, we already damaged them once, which means their hit points are 2, so 4 damage is definitely going to be enough to kill them, and we can remove them from play. But Legolas isn't done yet. Let's flip him around for just a moment so we can get a better look at his card text. You'll notice that Legolas has an ability right on his card. It's a response. And after Legolas participates in an attack that destroys an enemy, place two progress tokens on the current quest. Also on this attachment it says, after attached hero attacks and destroys an enemy, place one progress token on the current quest. So what this means is we get to place three progress tokens on our current active location. Because the current active location only requires three progress tokens, it means we've successfully traveled to this location, we've faced the threats here, and now we can remove this location card from play. Alright, way to go Elf, but now Gimli gets to attack as well. I'm going to exhaust Gimli to declare him as an attacker, and he's going to target the forest spider. So Gimli has an attack strength of 4. Remember he starts with 2, but then gets an additional 1 for each damage token on him. That's in his card abilities. So we're going to take that attack strength of 4, subtract the defense strength of the forest spider, which is 1. That means we're going to be able to place 3 damage counters on the forest spider. You'll notice the forest spider has 4 hit points, so 3 damage counters are not enough to kill it. So now you can see why I chose Legolas to attack the orcs and not Gimli. Because of Legolas' attachment and his card abilities, we got a big bonus by being able to place three progress tokens on our active location. And quite frankly, what this shows is our elf is having to pick up the slack for these dwarves. But now it's the refresh phase. And this is quite simple. We get to ready all of our exhausted cards. Of course, it can't all be good news. We have to increase our threat level by one at the end of each refresh phase. Now that's the end of the first turn, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin the next turn. Remember, in our resource phase, we get to add one resource token to each of our heroes' resource pool, and then we get to draw a new card and add it to our playing hand. I'm going to zoom in real close, talk quickly about the different cards in my hand, and then I'm going to leave it to you guys to decide what to do during the planning phase. Remember, during the planning phase, we get to pay for and bring out cards in our hand. 
So the first card in our hand is the Gondorian Spearman. He's an ally card, and he has the ability of a Sentinel. Now that only comes up in a two-player game, so we'll ignore that now, but he also has this response. After Gondorian Spearman is declared as a defender, deal one damage to the attacking enemy. So what this means is, before we resolve the attack and look at the attack and defense of the different characters, just by declaring him a defender, we are going to be able to place one damage token on the attacking enemy. The second card we have to bring out is another ally. He doesn't have any special abilities except for ranged, and that also only takes place in a two-player game. We also have an event card. Now remember, event cards are cards that can be played almost at any time during the game. The action here is you can exhaust a character you control with the ranged keyword to choose a player. And you get to deal one damage to each enemy engaged with that player. <laughs> so now you remember, on the last card, that card had the ability of range, and I said that really only takes place during a two-player game. And that's true, however, we can take advantage of that ability to use our ranged characters to activate this event card. So in other words, this card will allow us to put one damage token on every enemy that has left the staging area and is going to be attacking us. Next we have Quick Strike. We can exhaust a character we control to immediately declare it as an attacker and resolve its attack against any eligible enemy target. So what this does is it allows us to declare an attack during almost any stage of our turn. So if we wanted to be really sneaky, just before our questing phase, we could declare one of our characters as an attacker and potentially kill an enemy sitting in the staging area, making it that much easier to get progress tokens on our active location. We also have Swift Strike. After a character is declared as a defender, deal two damage to the attacking enemy. So again, as soon as we've declared a character as a defender, we get to do an immediate two damage to that attacking enemy. This means that the enemy could be killed even before it gets a chance to resolve its attack. The last card in our hand is the card I just drew. It's the Gandalf Ally card. Look at these stats. He has a willpower strength of four, an attack strength of four, and a defense strength of four. But keep in mind, at the end of the round, you have to discard Gandalf from play, so he's only going to last one turn. But that's not all. Look at his response. After Gandalf enters play, you have to choose one of the following. You can draw three new cards, deal four damage to one enemy in play, or reduce your threat by five. This is one of the most powerful cards in the deck, and you'll notice it doesn't have a sphere of influence icon on it. This is the one neutral card you get in the core set. People who've played this game before may be suspicious at this point that I stacked the deck to ensure I got this card at this point in time, but I want to assure you, all the cards in this gameplay have been completely randomized and I'm drawing them just the way it could happen in a game that you're playing. I just got really lucky. One drawback is that this card costs 5 points to bring into play, and we don't have that many yet. So that's it. Yeah, that's it. It's a lot, isn't it? Sorry I had to break up the first turn into two parts, but I don't like when a video goes longer than 10 to 13 minutes, and besides, 20 30 minutes of rules is, is a lot to process. The next videos are going to be a lot quicker because I'm not going to be taking the time to explain each step of the turn. And even if you're still a little bit confused right now, you'll be surprised that through repetition, just how much sense each turn makes. I hope you guys start submitting me some feedback on what you've seen. If you have any questions, let me know. And also, let me know what you want to do with these resource tokens that we have. Which allies or attachments? Well, we don't have attachments. But what, which allies, if any, do you want to bring out? And perhaps how many resource tokens do you want to save for future turns? We'll see you then.